Okay. So today and also in the next lectures, uh, we start a new topic for this course that is um, evaluation uh, and evaluation in particular in the, in the field of uh, human computer interaction, of course. So today we will see uh, a quick introduction to evaluation in, in general in XCI, um, and then we will move uh, towards um, some concrete example of evaluation techniques. Uh, and for the next uh, three lectures, I think, we'll focus on expert evaluations. So expert checking our designs, our prototypes, uh, according to some, some principles, okay? So just to recap, um, this is uh, a figure that shows the four pillars of a successful user interface design and was proposed by Ben Snederman and Catherine Plezant. I think that you should uh, have already seen this, this picture. Just to recap where we are in this course, so uh, the first pillar, uh, we started the course actually with, with neat finding uh, through which we extracted some, um, some user needs, some requirements to start thinking about our problem and the needs of the users and how to solve these kind of needs. So we have seen some, some strategies like ethnographic observation, but also interviews, surveys, to conduct uh, need finding and extract uh, requirements. Then we move to the third pillar here. Uh, starting from the, the needs that we extracted, we started prototyping something, no, right? So designing site, something. Um, and uh, we started with low fidelity prototypes, and we are also using some, some tools for like Figma for our medium fidelity prototypes. And in designing, in prototyping our solutions, we are also exploiting the second pillar here, the pillar about uh, theories and models. So we learn how to use some strategies, some tools like guidelines, uh, design patterns. So tools that can help us, that can guide uh, our design, design process. Now it's time to start evaluating what we are producing, our artifacts, our prototypes. And so we are starting the, the fourth pillar, the last pillar of, of this course, okay? So uh, the first thing to, to say here, it's important to say that the evaluation, it's, it's not something that happens at the end only of the design process but you should have different evaluations during, during the design process. And this is probably the most important point of, of this lesson, okay? Because otherwise, uh, if you have just a single evaluation at the end of the, the design process, the risk is that, okay, I design everything, I implement my application, one year of development, and then you test your application with your final users, and you discover that your application is, is terrible. It cannot be used by anyone because it has a lot of usability issues. So you have to start from scratch. You, you need to start again to develop, to, to fix very important issues. So this is something that we should avoid. Uh, so we should have uh, different evaluations in our design process. And through the evaluation uh, steps, we should correct we should fix any, any issues as soon as possible, okay? Uh, we can have obviously different kinds of evaluation in XCI. Uh, here the first pillar proposes a first distinction that is between expert reviews, that is the topic of the next uh, few lectures, and usability testing. Here the difference is that uh, expert reviews uh, involves experts checking uh, our, our designs. And in this course, we will apply an expert review technique in uh, assignment five. You should already know that in assignment five, you will take the role of experts, okay? And you will evaluate the prototypes of other groups through heuristic evaluation. And then usability testing instead is a kind of technique that involves uh, the target population. 
okay? So probably in uh, assignment six, uh, if I remember correctly, you will also conduct a usability testing by involving the same uh, people that you recruited in the need finding uh, uh, method, okay? And then we will see there are a lot of different uh, strategies like controlled experiments, in the field studies, and so on. Okay, so again, uh, we should already know how to generate design solutions with the help of tools like guidelines, principles, design patterns, and, and so on. And we are now starting to evaluate our, our designs, okay? And these are the same uh, keywords that, that were reported in the, in the figure. So what does it mean evaluating something in the XCI, XCI context? Let's start with this brief introduction to evaluation. So evaluation means uh, testing uh, in ACI mainly three things uh, of an interactive system, usability, uh, functionality, and uh, acceptability. And we will see some, some definition in a moment. Um, as I said before, this is the key point of today. So evaluation is a tool to identify and correct issues as soon as possible, so you should have uh, different evaluations in, in different design stages, okay? So for example, uh, you start with your low fidelity prototype and before moving to a medium, a high fidelity prototype, you evaluate the low fidelity prototype so that you can fix some issues before moving to the next stage. So this is the uh, ideal process that, that you should follow, obviously, in the course. We cannot evaluate all the steps, but this should be the ideal process. Um, obviously, we have different techniques, and uh, um, actually not all the techniques are useful in all the stages. Okay? So there are some techniques that are more suitable for the early stages of design, so for example, to test uh, low fidelity prototypes, and there are other techniques that are most suitable for a final evaluation. Okay? So, uh, for a final uh, implementation of a mobile application, for example, you will probably upload the application on the Google Play Store and you will ask hundreds of participants to install the application and use it freely for a month, for example. This is an in-the-wild testing and we will see uh, some examples. Um, so, this kind of strategy is useful, obviously, at the end of the design process. So, you apply different techniques and with different techniques you learn something different according to the design stage that you are uh, evaluating. Uh, so you evaluate your, your artifacts according to the initial, the initial goals, of course, and you can also test uh, different usability dimensions, uh, obviously, using a range of different, uh, different techniques. So, Again, we are interested in testing three main things, usability, functionality, and acceptability. And you should already know what usability is, right? Actually, uh, i taken these slides for, for a previous uh, lesson. So usability is how well users can use the system, the system functionality, right? Uh, and inside the general concept of usability, you can have different dimensions that you can test with your, with your evaluations. So you can test, for example, the usefulness of the system. So is the system something that people want or not? You can test the learnability. So is the system easy to learn or every time the user open your system, your application, the user needs to uh, learn from scratch how the system works. Uh, then you can have memorability, effectiveness. So is the tool able to allow users to reach the goal and so on, efficiency, visibility, errors. This is usability. Then we can have functionality. So um, obviously each system uh, has a set of different uh, functionality. Um, so here we should test if these functionality are compliant with the needs of the users, the needs of the users that we extracted in the need finding phase. 
okay? So obviously the system should enable users to perform the task they need and not other tasks, of, co of course. Um, so also functionality can be tested in, in different ways according to different uh, dimensions. And here I reported three, three questions that can guide uh, an evaluation of, of functionality. So uh, we should test if the system includes all the appropriate functionality and if these functionality are available in the system. Um, we can also test, we can also assess if this functionality, functionality are reachable by the user. So for example, if they are visible, they can be uh, performed by the user uh, on the system. And more importantly, uh, as I said before, we should, match, we should assess if the functionality provided by the system uh, matches the expectations of, of our users, okay? Um, and as we are measuring functionality here, it's also important to measure uh, the performance of the user with the system, right? Um, so here we are also interested in measuring the effectiveness of, of the system in assisting the user uh, solving, solving, supporting the task. And finally, we have acceptability, that is the degree to which the user will accept the system in, in their daily lives, in their daily activities, in the real world. So first of all, we should make a distinction here. Uh, traditionally, acceptability, acceptability is defined as the perception of the user before using the system. Um, and uh, technology acceptance is instead uh, the perception of the user after having used the system. But in any case, a good user interface design uh, obviously can make a product uh, easy to understand and to use, and this results in uh, a greater user acceptance, of course. So testing acceptability means testing different things, also in this case, like the enjoyment and the emotional responses to a system by the user. Uh, and this is particularly useful for systems that aimed at leisure or entertainment. And we can measure, for example, satisfaction, comfort, and in particular it's important here to identify all the parts or the sections of our, our designs that may overload the user. So for example, you can have, uh, I don't know, a recommender system in an interface that is showing millions of uh, recommendations at the same time in the home page. This may overload the user, of course. If you display too many information in, on the screen, this may overload the user. So it could be a critical point also for acceptability. We have seen last time uh, design patterns and in particular dark patterns. Uh, so a system with many dark patterns uh, like attention capture damaging patterns may overload the user, of course. So reducing the, the presence of dark patterns is another way to increase acceptability, of course. But before reducing these, these dark patterns, we should identify them in, in the interface. And so this is how we can evaluate acceptability and increase acceptability uh, in this sense. Okay? So, uh, we talked about what is evaluation. Now it's time to look at the different approaches that, that we can have, uh, the different evaluation strategies. And a first important distinction about evaluations uh, is related to the place in which the evaluation is conducted, okay? So we can have uh, evaluations conducted in the laboratory, so in the lab studies, and we can have evaluations conducted in the field, so in the real world. So let's explore this first distinction. And let's start with uh, in-lab studies. So as the name suggests, in-the-lab studies are conducted in the lab, okay? In a research lab, uh, in the designer place. So the designer, the researcher, recruit a set of participants, and these participants are taken out from their normal work environment, their daily activities, to take part in a controlled test. Why it's controlled? Because 
the researcher, the designer, control the environment, simulate the context uh, inside the laboratory. Okay? So the researcher, the designer can simulate the context according to, to the needs of, of the research group, of the, the designer group, um, and can test different hypotheses, maybe by varying some, some parameters inside this kind of simulation of, of the context. So the researcher, the designer can control the evaluation. Uh, this kind of studies are typically conducted in the early stages of design, at the beginning of the design process. And the first reason is that uh, by simulating the context, by simulating uh, the environment, you can also conduct this kind of uh, studies without having the final implementation of your system. Okay? And typically, lab studies are also used, for example, for comparing alternatives. For example, in assignment number two or three, I don't remember, you produced two different low-level fidelity, low fidelity prototypes, right? So you have to decide which is the most promising prototype, the prototype to be selected to continuing your design process. Okay, you can conduct an in-the-lab study uh, to ask users to uh, evaluate with users which is the most promising prototype, for example. There are obviously pros and cons of, of any uh, evaluation techniques, and in this case, for lab studies, um, the first pro is that through this kind of evaluation you can also simulate dangerous environments, okay? So for example, in the aerospace domain, uh, before sending uh, uh, astronauts on the space, you can have an in-the-lab study to simulate this kind of dangerous environments, right? Uh, the same for the medical domain, any domain that may have dangerous environments. And then, these kind of lab studies are suitable for specific tasks within a system. So, we don't need a final implementation, we can use these kind of evaluations to test specific tasks within a system, like the tasks that you defined uh, in, in the last assignments, right? There are obviously a set of drawbacks of in the lab studies, and I think the main one is the lack of context. So, the context is simulated uh, and it cannot be the same as the real context, right? So this kind of simulation may also create some unnatural situations that may lead to biases. So the uh, participant is in the lab, but the participant knows probably that the context is simulated and the participant probably knows that there is some researcher, some, some designer that is observing him, is observing her. And this may create, obviously, biases in the answers of the participant and the, in the behaviors of, of the participant during the test. And finally, these kind of studies are not suitable for all the tasks, obviously. So let's imagine we need to uh, evaluate a mobile application that is using some GPS to track our running sessions. Obviously, uh, this task cannot be tested in the lab. So the participant, okay, uh, may start running in the room, but obviously it's not the same as running uh, in the wild, right? Uh, so to make an example of an in the wild study, let me open uh, uh, a document that describes um, an in the, wild, uh, in the lab study, sorry, that we conducted in our research activities. Um, Okay. So, as I said before, in the lab studies are controlled studies, so they need to be carefully designed and planned before, uh, before being uh, implemented. So it's fundamental to, to have some documents describing, describing the, the study. And this was a document describing a study in our research activities. I mentioned last time the If This Then That platform. I repeat again, it's a platform to define trigger action rules connecting the behaviors 
of your devices like the smartphone and your uh, digital services like social networks and, and so on. So you can create some rules like if I receive a message on Telegram then blinks the lamp in the kitchen uh, or at sunset, like this one, turn the lights on in the living room, for example. Okay? Um, in this case, we developed a recommender system for this kind of platform. So a recommender system that directly suggests some rules that, uh, like this one uh, to the user according to uh, the preference of the user and the past interaction of the user with the system. And this was a um, lab study to test the effectiveness of such an approach. So as you can see, the document reports some introduction, some background information about the Internet of Things, uh, end user development, uh, trigger action rules, uh, and, uh, and platforms like uh, if this then that. Then there is a description of the evaluation with all the specific strategies and methodologies adopted uh, inside the lab study. So this was a between subject study with a single think aloud task and so on. Then we have some research questions. So it's a control study, so we can make some hypotheses and we can test these hypotheses. And it's important to specify uh, the research questions that, that we are trying to, to investigate in this case. So here we were interested in uh, evaluating the usefulness of the approach and the usability <laughs> and so on. Then you have also the specification of your participants, so your target population, the, the participants that will take part in the study, in this case, 20 participants are recruited from people that do not have any training nor experience in computer science and programming. So in this case, we were interested in trying the system, evaluating the system with non-expert uh, users. Then you have a task, so the task to be performed by the participant in the lab. So this is how we can simulate the scenario. So here we are imagining a, a fake, a fictional user that has some uh, devices and, and is subscribed to some uh, digital service like Facebook and Twitter. And then in a separate file there is the goal for this, for this scenario. Uh, so what the participant should do with, with, the, with the system in, in the task. And then for each participant and for each task actually, we also collect a range of measures, right? So, for example, the number of defined rules, the time spent by the participants with the, with the interface, and so on, some questionnaires before and after the task. So we list exactly all the measures that we are collecting in this study, and by analyzing these measures, then we can answer to our search questions, okay? And finally, there is the script. So, Nothing is improvised. These are exactly the words, the sentences that the researcher will use with all the participants, okay? We, uh, so that we can avoid to introduce any kind of, of biases. So as you can see, this kind of uh, studies need to be carefully designed and planned before being uh, implemented. So let's go back to our slides. And let's talk about field study instead, that uh, are instead evaluations that um, happens in the real world. So the designer or the evaluator or the researcher uh, upload the system somewhere or give the system the prototype, the final implementation to the participants, and the participants try the system uh, in their daily activities in their daily, daily lives, okay? Um, so here the goal is to observe the system in action, obviously. Also here we have some pros and cons. Uh, the open nature, so the real context is of course a pro of this kind of, of studies. So we are in the natural environment of the user, so we can reduce all these kind of unnatural situations uh, that, that were a cons of in the lab studies. There are also a set of drawbacks, of course. Uh, we obviously have a low degree of control uh, because 
the study it's in the real world and we can control everything in the real world. So, for example, here in an in the lab study, you don't have to uh, produce a working implementation of your system. Uh, the implementation can also be fake. So this kind of lab studies typically last 30 minutes, one hour. Um, if your application doesn't work after one hour, it's not a problem. You can reset it and start again with a new participant. Obviously, in an in the wild study, your application should work, okay? And it should not crash after, after two hours, otherwise it's, it's a big problem for an in the wild study, okay? And you, you then have a low degree of control. You also have a higher cost because, again, you need a final implementation, a working implementation with your system, and typically these kind of studies are obviously longer, so while a lab study typically lasts one hour, an in the wild study may last uh, one month, for example. So you have a longer duration and typically you also need to recruit more participants. An example, also this one taken from our research activities of an in the wild test. Let me open the slides and let me go to the in the wild study part, if I can. Okay, okay. So in this case, it's an example uh, in the digital wellbeing topic. So one of the topic that we are addressing also in this course with some groups. Uh, in this research work, we developed uh, a mobile application uh, um, including all the traditional strategies that are used by digital self-control tools. So what is a digital self-control tool? It's an application um, that uh, helps users uh, regulate and hopefully reduce the time they spend on uh, devices and uh, social networks and so on. So as you probably know, also your smartphones already include some digital wellbeing tool. So for Android smartphone is, the app is called Digital Wellbeing or Benessere Digitale in Italian. And also on iPhone, there is Apple Screen Time that can help you uh, track your, your time spent on your device and, and set up some, some interventions. So in this, particular application, we included some, some statistics uh, in the application about uh, the time spent on the phone in general and about the time spent for each specific application of the user. And we also included some common intervention, like for example, uh, usage timers. So by using this kind of application, the user can set up a usage timer, for example, on, uh, I think there is the example on YouTube, so that after a session of five minutes on YouTube, for example, the application uh, open a pop-up uh, saying, okay, uh, you have reached your time limit on YouTube, it's time to close the app. Okay, and our goal was to test if this kind of uh, interventions that are already included in uh, state-of-the-art, let's call them in this way, digital self-control tools are effective or not. So, as you can see, there is a final implementation. This is a video of a real mobile application. We uploaded it on the Google Play Store and we recruited 39 participants to test the application for three weeks. Okay? Um, before I said that in, a, in the West study you have a low degree of control, but actually you can control something depending on uh, how you implement your tools. In this case, uh, we controlled two different phases. So the f in the first week, the application worked as a background service, so the application only collected silently uh, usage data for the user. So how many time the user spent on the, on the smartphone and for each application, for example. Then after one week, the, uh, the application automatically started to provide users with all the functionality of the app. So 
uh, consulting statistics, uh, uh, defining interventions, uh, and so on. And our goal, obviously, was to compare the data collected here in the intervention phase with the data collected here in the collection phase to see if the application has an impact on users or not. And these are the kind of analyses that you can extract from an in the wild study. So these are objective analyses that focus on specific metrics like the, the average usage time of the user. Okay? So here is a, is a chart um, comparing the usage time in the intervention phase with the usage time in the, in the control phase, let's say. Okay? So you can actually investigate if the application, if your system, for example, has an impact on the behavior of the user. Okay? And obviously, it's a longer study that requires um, a working implementation of the system. So typically, you recruited hundreds of participants, but then you have to exclude many of them because, for example, the application on their specific smartphones stopped working after one week. And so, for example, to have 39 participants, uh, as in this case, I think we probably recruited uh, 100 participants. Okay? So, there can be also problems uh, like the app stopped working after, after a while, uh, or the specific smartphone, I don't know, doesn't support the, a feature that is implemented on, on the application. Okay. So let's go back to our slides. Okay, and these were uh, in the lab study. Another distinction between different kind of evaluations um, is about the participants of, of the evaluation. So, uh, first of all, evaluation may be based on expert evaluation. So, on the evaluation by experts. And this is the topic of the next uh, few lectures. So, experts that uh, evaluate our designs, our prototypes, according to some, some principles. And you can have different kind of uh, uh, expert evaluation, like analytic methods, model-based methods, so experts applying some, some models to our uh, artifacts. We can have also heuristic evaluation, uh, that is the strategy that you will adopt in assignment five, uh, and so on. Um, so, these kind of evaluations are useful um, because we can identify any portion, any part of our designs that we know will cause difficulties according to some uh, well-known cognitive principles. And this is why these evaluations sh should be conducted by experts, because they must know what are these kind of cognitive principles, of course. Um, so we can use this, these tests before uh, evaluating our application uh, with uh, final users. So with experts, we can, let, we can remove all the issues that are easy to solve, uh, and then we can focus on bigger problems with our target, uh, target populations. So this kind of uh, strategies can be adopted in, uh, at any stage uh, in the development process, but typically are uh, adopted at the beginning. Um, they are also relatively cheap because we, we don't need to recruit any, any uh, participants from our target population. And as we will see probably next time, methods like heuristic evaluations only require three to five experts. Okay? Um, and the cons, obviously, is that uh, we are not, especially at the, in the early stages of design, we are not testing the actual use of, of the system. Evaluations, however, may also involve users, target users. Um, and again, we have different strategies here. Um, a first distinction is between experimental and observational methods and, and query methods. So in experimental and observational methods, we can uh, 
test some hypothesis uh, looking at the participants using our, our tools, our prototypes. So we get empirical evidence, but obviously they require more time to be designed and analyzed, as I showed you before with, with the example of the in the lab test. Uh, query techniques instead, uh, like interviews, because some methods that you used in the need finding part uh, can also be used as an evaluation technique. For example, you used interviews to extract user needs, but you can also use interviews to evaluate your, your prototypes. Okay? So you give your prototype to a user, uh, to a participant, the participant try the prototype, and then you can conduct an interview to, to get some feedback from, from the user. Okay? So you can also use this kind of uh, query techniques for evaluating uh, uh, in XCI. And these kind of strategies rely on asking the user about the interface directly. So you, you get the direct feedback of the user. This kind of methods are relatively simple and cheap, but obviously you get subjective results. So you are not able to extract empirical evidence, of course. And finally, we can also have um, we can also adopt uh, automated evaluation, and this is something that we will not cover in this course uh, because it's a very specific kind of, of evaluation um, that uh, performs some some kind of simulation and extract some kind of software measures uh, from, from your uh, code, okay? So this is the reason why these kind of evaluations uh, are performed at the end on, on the working implementation of your system. Um, so you can uh, adopt, for example, formal evaluation techniques uh, with models and mathematical formulas to test very specific aspects of your code or of your interface. For example, okay, this button should be placed two pixels uh, on the left because otherwise the performance of the user decreases of 25%. I don't know. Very specific issues uh, by applying uh, strategies like formal, formal verification models and formulas. But uh, we will not cover this, this topic uh, in this course. Okay. This was the introduction to the evaluation. Do you have any particular questions? Okay, so if you don't have any questions, we can start with the first example of a particular strategy, uh, the cognitive walkthrough, uh, that is the first example of an expert uh, uh, review method. Okay, we will see this one, cognitive walkthrough, and then heuristic evaluation uh, probably next time. Um, so cognitive walkthrough is a very simple technique. It's very simple, but it's also time consuming. Okay, and we will see in a moment why. So what is cognitive walkthrough? Is a step-by-step -step revisions revision of a sequence of actions so of interaction steps that we can perform with our systems to perform a given task. So here there are two important things. The task, okay, the task is going through this presentation slides and the action to perform the tasks. For example, here there is one single action clicking on the right arrow. Okay, so two things, task and a set of actions. The evaluators that are expert in XCI uh, examine each step by performing each action looking for possible problems. Okay? So the evaluator uh, has a task and a set of actions. The evaluator starts from the, the beginning. Uh, he or she performs the first action and then reason about possible problems uh, for this specific action answering four different predefined questions, okay? And then again, I perform the second action and I look for possible problems, answering again the four predefined questions, okay, until the end. So this is the reason why it's, it's time consu consuming. 
You perform each action and for each action you must answer to four different questions investigating possible problems. Um, this kind of uh, strategy is particularly suited for uh, systems that are designed uh, for learning by exploration and in particular are useful to evaluate uh, if the system is easy to learn for, for the users. Okay? So in performing the actions, the evaluator can reason about, okay, is this particular action easy to learn for the user or not? Or are there some, some problems? So for example, we will see an example about YouTube uh, and in particular about the task of uploading a video on YouTube. So the evaluator can imagine, it's, okay, it's the first time that I see the YouTube website. Is it easy to learn, for example, where the button, the specific button for uploading a video is or not? And what are the possible problems? So the main focus, again, is to establish uh, how easy a system is to learn for a given population. And the evaluators go through each step, each action, uh, and provide a story about uh, why that step is easy, is good for the user, or, or not. And providing a story means answering to this kind of four questions that we will see in a minute. So how can we conduct a cognitive walkthrough. Uh, we need four things in advance, so before conducting the study. We first need a specification or a prototype of the system. So uh, it doesn't have to be complete, so we don't need a final implementation of the system, uh, but it should be a fairly detailed prototype, a prototype that allow users to perform at least a set of important tasks, okay? Like the medium fidelity prototypes that you are developing in assignment four, okay? So uh, your medium fidelity prototypes allow users to at least perform the three tasks that, that you define, and that's fine. We can, we can evaluate your prototypes with a cognitive or true method. Then you need, of course, the description of the task or the set of important tasks that you want to evaluate and that will be performed by, by the evaluators. Um, so a set of representative tasks uh, that most users will want to do, like the three tasks that, that you define in your assignment. Then for each task, you need a complete written list, so for example, on a sheet of paper, um, of the actions that you need to complete the task, okay? And we will see an example. So for uploading a video on YouTube, you first have to click on a given button, then selecting an item from a drop-down menu, and, and so on. And last but not least, an indication of who the users are. So some background information of the, let's say, normal, target population of the, given, of the given system that the evaluator needs to evaluate. So with some indication of the experience, the knowledge of, of the participants. And this is important because, okay, the evaluators are uh, experts, probably in human-computer interaction, uh, but during the, the evaluation, the expert will um, impersonate another kind of user. So the evaluator must think like uh, the target user because the evaluator needs to understand, to investigate if the specific system is easy to learn for the specific target population. So for example, if you are uh, developing, designing uh, an application in the medical domain, probably you need to give to the evaluator some background information about the medical domain some information about the skills and the knowledge of the doctors that will use your application so that the evaluator can think like the doctor while using, while using the system, okay? Okay, these were the four things that you need in advance. And then, uh, again, each evaluator, typically uh, individually, 
can start the cognitive walk through and can replicate all the actions reported in, in the sheet of paper. And for each action, the evaluator must check, must answer the following four questions. Uh, that are some questions complement some other questions, so there are some similarities between, between the questions, but let's start with the first one that is probably the, the most complex to, to understand. So the first question is, is the effect of the action the same as the user goal at that point? So obviously each user action on the system will have a particular effect, right? So is this effect the same uh, as what the user is trying to achieve at this point? So in other words, will the user try to achieve the right result? So here we are examining if the designer of the, um, of the interface has maybe uh, performed some wrong assumption about the mental model of the user, okay? So we are also examining whether the interface is making uh, some wrong assumptions about the level of experience of the target population. Okay, so for example, uh, for uploading a video on YouTube, you have to drag and drop a file uh, inside the platform. And there is a label, please drag and drop a file here. So here we are asking ourselves, is a user of our target population able to understand what drag and drop means? Okay, probably for most of YouTube users, yes. Okay, but we are investigating this kind of, of things. And we can also ask ourselves if uh, the designer has used some uh, wrong metaphor or some wrong language. Maybe the designer has used some keyword, some sentence that uh, have a particular meaning for the domain uh, of the designer, but that have a completely different meaning uh, in common sense for, for, for the users. So we are investigating this kind of mismatches. Second question, will users see that the action is available or not? So here we are, it's just a question about visibility. We are not investigating if the user is able to recognize that this is the correct button. We are just investigating if the button is visible on the screen. So we are experts, we probably know what, which is the correct button. Is it visible on the screen or not? Okay? The third question complements the previous one. And here the question is about the user ability to recognize the, the step, the, the, the particular element to be, for example, clicked. So maybe the right button is, is visible, but is the user able to understand that the correct button is exactly this one? Okay? So, for example, uh, is the label associated to the button appropriate in this case or not? And finally, the last uh, question is about feedback. You should probably know that feedback is very important in an interface, so after the action is, is taken, uh, obviously an action probably will produce a feedback on the user interface. Is this feedback understandable by the user or, or not? So obviously, if there are no feedback at all, uh, this, is a, this is a problem, obviously. Okay, so obviously while conducting uh, the cognitive walkthrough, it's very important to, to document uh, all the process uh, and keep a record on what is good and what is not good and, and the different problems that the evaluator uh, find in your, in your interface. Uh, and so each evaluator should uh, keep track of, of the process uh, and there is a structured, a consolidated way of, of uh, keeping track of cognitive or true. Um, so on a sheet of paper or on a digital support you should include the date, 
and the time of the walkthrough, the names of, of the evaluators. Uh, then you should report the answers to all the four questions for each action. Um, and it's important to report on a separate file uh, any negative answer, uh, because obviously the goal of this kind of uh, strategies is to provide the designers with a list of problems that should be fixed. So all the reported problems should be detailed uh, in, a, in a separate file. Uh, and also each problem should include a degree of severity. And this will also be the case of heuristic evaluation. So the degree of severity is very important for allowing uh, designers uh, to define priorities. Okay, there is some problems that are very big and it's uh, very high priority. Uh, you should fix this kind of problems, uh, otherwise your system will not work. Okay, so start from the high priority problems. Then you can also have uh, some minor problems. So it would be nice to uh, fix this part of the user interface, but probably your system can also work without these kind of fixes. So start with the high priority problems and then if you have time you can also fix the low priority ones. Okay, so it's important also to associate a degree of severity to each identified problems. Um, then, as I said before, the evaluators perform this kind of analysis individually and then they meet together uh, and, then try, uh, and they try to reach an agreement, okay, so that they can provide to the designers as a group a unique report uh, reaching an agreement of the different problems identified during the process. So maybe some evaluators have identified some problems and some other evaluators have identified some other problems, then maybe there are some conflicts that need to be solved before giving a final report to the designer team. So first example of today, uh, as I said before, the task is uploading a video on YouTube. You are probably familiar I'm sure that you are familiar with YouTube. I don't know if you are familiar with the task of uploading a video on YouTube. Um, here I tried to list some, some actions. It's not complete. It only includes the, the initial actions that you need to perform to upload a video on YouTube. So the first action in the home page, click on the create video icon. Then click on Upload Video in the drop-down menu that appears on the screen. Then drag and drop an MP4 file uh, on the modal that, appear, that appears on the screen or click on the Select File button to select a file from your PC. Then insert the title and the description of the video in the two related text fields. Then click on Next and, and so on. So now we focus obviously just on the first, uh, first action. So the first action is in the home page, click on the create video icon. So this is the, a screenshot of the YouTube uh, home page. I can also open the website in my browser. Okay, I need to upload a video. I should click on the create video icon. Where should I click? Okay, in the top right corner of uh, the interface, there is this icon with a camera and a plus. And as long as I move my mouse on the icon, there is a pop-up message create. So probably this is the right button. And if I click it, you can see there is a feedback. There is a drop-down menu that appears on the screen, and then I can perform the second action, upload video, and so on. But let's focus on the first action, that is this one, clicking on the uh, plus button. So let's go back to the slides, and let's try to answer the four, the four questions. So. Is the effect of the action the same as the user goal at that point? Are we adopting some wrong, assum 
uh, are the designers of YouTube ad adopting some wrong assumptions about the mental model of, of the target population? Obviously, this is an example. Before uh, conducting this kind of evaluation, we should also define uh, which is the target population, of course. Uh, so let's focus on normal YouTube users. So, I don't know. Uh, young uh, users of, of YouTube. Are we adopting some wrong assumptions here? No, your colleague said no. Any, any other ideas, opinions? So, obviously, it depends uh, from the uh, target population, of course. So, probably here, the plus icon, uh, at least to me, means adding something, right? So, I think here the designer is assuming that uh, our target population knows that uploading a video means first adding the file on the platform, right? I think that this is an assumption. So to upload something on the platform, the task is uploading, uh, means adding something, because the plus gives me the impression of adding something to, to the platform, right? And probably all the users inside our target population know that for uploading a video on YouTube, you have to add a file inside the platform. So probably the answer uh, to this question is yes for the target population. But this answer may, may change if we investigate the usage of YouTube for another kind of, of target population, for example, for older people. I don't know. So it depends. Will the user see that the action is available? I think yes. The button is on the screen. As I said before, uh, here with the second question, we are just investigating uh, visibility. So we know which is the correct button, and it's on the screen. So the answer to this question is, is yes. But will our users be 100% sure that this is the correct button? So are we using uh, the correct icons, labels, and so on, or not? Is the camera icon with a plus appropriate for uh, creating, for the, the, the action of clicking on a creating video uh, icon? Yes, probably yes for our target population. And OK. Uh, we have already seen the, the feedback, so when the action is taken, will users understand the feedback they get? Probably yes, because there is a drop-down menu with the label Upload Video, so uh, you can click on, on, on it. Okay, so th this was the first example, uh, I would say uh, a positive example of a, let's say, good user interface. Um, at least for this specific task. Uh, we have seen last time that YouTube, for example, includes a lot of attention capture damaging patterns that could be probably reduced for other tasks. Let's see another example. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with these colors and, and menus. Uh, so the Polytechnico website is always uh, good source of uh, uh, examples, uh, I would say bad examples. Um, I don't know if the designers fixed this, this part of the website. This is a screenshot, uh, I think, of two or three years ago. Um, this is the, the process that you must follow to enroll in the Politecnico, OK? So, the process that an high school student must follow to, to enroll in the Polytechnico. So 
the student must first insert some, some information, uh, some demographic information, so the password, uh, some information about uh, the high school, um, some information about the languages that, that he or she knows, so the level of English, the level of French, and, and so on. And then there is this wonderful orientational project, let's call it in this way. So to help users uh, make uh, the choice of the path uh, inside the Politecnico, so as you probably know, you can enroll for computer engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on, the Politecnico is offering to the students the possibility to, to participate in some lectures before, before the choice. Um, so there are some, if you apply to this project, there are some lessons on maths and physics that are predefined by default. It's in Italian, but okay, I can translate. So there are some lessons uh, on maths and physics. If you apply to this orientational project, uh, you, will, you will follow this kind of, of lessons. And then the student has also the possibility to insert, uh, to participate in some lessons about urban planning and uh, industrial design. Okay? So maths and physics are selected. You can also add some lessons about urban planning and design by clicking here on the date. So here, I don't want to participate. Here, I can select the date to add this kind of lessons in this orientational project. Okay? So it's already terrible, this part, but let's assume, assume that this part works. Okay? We are focusing now in this specific part. So to enroll in the, in the program, uh, we need to pay 25 euros with credit card or, or math. Okay? So we are focusing on this specific task. The task is enrolling in this, in this orientational project, and the action is pay. Right? So first question. Is the effect of the action the same as the user goal at this point? Are we making some wrong assumptions here? Yes? I don't know if I have to click the continuum or Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> here we have <laughs> two different buttons. One is continue and the other one is next. So to me, continue and next means probably the same thing, right? So where should I click? Continue, next? That's probably a, a problem for this kind of interface. So it's true. If I am here in the process, I probably know how the button next with the arrow works because I clicked it multiple times before. But still, I have to think for two or three seconds, OK, which is the correct button? So probably all the users will know that this button next will, um, will make advance the process to the next tab. But still, we need to think two or three seconds. So there was also a book that probably Professor De Russi mentioned in the, in the course, Don't Make Me Think. Okay? So a good user interface should avoid this kind of, of problems, of mismatches. Second question, is the action pay visible? Anybody seeing a an uh, pay action here? No, it's not visible. So we probably know that this is the button for, for paying, but the action pay that is explicitly mentioned here, it's, it's not visible. And again, the third question, are we 100% sure that the user will identify the correct button? Again, probably no. Maybe after five seconds, yes, but still there is, there is a problem. Okay? And we cannot answer to the fourth question now because we don't know uh, which is the feedback here. Uh, 
so we cannot answer to, to, the, fourth, uh, to the fourth question. So, in your opinion, uh, what are the different possibilities here to improve this kind of design? Yeah, the, the first thing to do is probably changing the label from continue to pay. No? It's an easy fix, but already uh, solves many different, many different problems. Uh, then you could also have maybe two different buttons. Uh, one is pay, the other one is I'm not interested, and the I'm not interested button make you uh, go to the, to the next tab. So we can obviously fix this interface in different ways, but I agree with your colleague. The first thing to do is probably changing the label from continue to, to pay, right? OK. So we have just seen the first example of uh, an expert evaluation, uh, cognitive or true. So in these last 10 minutes, I would like to introduce uh, the topic for the next lessons and the assignment that is another example of expert review method, uh, heuristic uh, evaluation. So experts, again, that are checking our uh, designs, our prototypes, applying a set of heuristics that we will see are a set of principles, rule of thumbs, to, be, to assess, in this case, usability problems. So the main goal here of the cognitive or true was to investigate uh, uh, the learnability of the system. Uh, here we focus specifically on usability, usability problems. So this technique is also called uh, design critique because experts will critique your, your designs um, obviously not from a negative point of view, but just to allow you to improve your, your solutions, your, your designs. Um, and this technique can be useful uh, in many different design stages. So for example, as I said before, for uh, this kind of techniques in general, they are useful before user testing, okay? Because you can actually save effort by solving uh, the easy to solve problems. So the problems that we as experts know that are problematic. So we don't need the target population to understand that we should change this label from continue to pay, right? So we can then leave user testing for, for bigger issues. We can also uh, adopt heuristic evaluation before redesigning. So let's imagine uh, we want to uh, release the second version of our wonderful application, okay? So there is already a first version of our application. We need to release the second version and we want to understand, to identify the good parts, so the parts of the version number one that we should, uh, we should uh, continue to, to keep in our new version and identify the bad parts, so the parts that uh, need some, some redesigning. So we can conduct an heuristic evaluation to start investigating uh, this kind of uh, good and bad, and bad parts. We can also use this technique to generate evidence for problems that are somewhat known. Uh, for example, we have our application already uploaded on the Play Store and we received some very uh, negative reviews, okay? We don't know if there is actually a problem. Some users highlighted some, some bad things, but uh, we don't yet have some evidence about the problem, so we can conduct uh, an heuristic evaluation to understand if, if the reviews are, if, if we should take into account the reviews. So to, to generate evidence for, for some, some problems. 
And obviously we can also uh, use this kind of technique before releasing our application, for example, for smoothing and polishing our, our design. Uh, this method was proposed by Jakob Nielsen, uh, and you can see him in the, in the picture, in 1994. Uh, Jakob Nielsen is a researcher designer that uh, also uh, works with uh, Don Norman, that is another uh, important person that you have already seen in this, in this course. They actually founded a company together and they are still working together. Um, and Nielsen proposed heuristic evaluation as a structured design critique technique um, that uses a set of simple and general heuristics. So what are heuristics? Uh, are some guidelines or general principles or uh, rule of thumbs that can guide a, decide, a design decision, okay? Uh, so by applying this set of 10 uh, heuristics, experts can check, can assess usability problems in a design. Typically, uh, you conduct these kind of evaluations using the heuristics proposed by Nielsen, but you can also obviously, uh, before conducting a heuristic evaluation, define your own heuristics to be, to be checked by, by the experts, but again, typically and in this course, we will exploit the 10 heuristics defined by Nielsen. Um, this expert review is conducted by a small group of experts. Three to five are enough, and we will see next time why. So you don't need many, many experts. Just three to five are, are sufficient to identify most of the problems that can arise in your, in your interfaces. Um, and again, uh, it's, it's suitable for any stage of the design, and the goal is finding usability problems uh, in a design. This kind of evaluation is also called discount usability, if you look on the web. Uh, discount usability because it's a cheap method. You, you only need three to five uh, experts. You don't need to recruit any, any participants for your target population, so it's cheap, and this is why it's also called uh, discount usability. So, uh, basic idea, first of all, define a set of heuristics or principle, or use uh, the predefined ones by, by Nielsen. Then you give this set of heuristics to a group of experts, so Typically, experts have the heuristics reported in a, in a sheet of paper, and each expert individually, as I said before, uh, will use the heuristics to look for problems in the design, in your prototypes, for example. It's important that each expert work independently, so each expert will find different problems. Then at the end, experts communicate uh, and try to reach an agreement before sharing their findings to the designer groups. So, uh, when experts communicate, they try to find and analyze and aggregate uh, the problems that they have found, and each problem, also in this case, uh, has a severity rating, so experts should also reach an agreement about the severity of, of, the, of the problems, of the identified problems, and then they, ca they can give a report to, to, the, to the designer group, okay? So we will replicate this process also in this course. So your prototype will be evaluated by two or three other uh, students in this course, then these students will meet together, will try to reach an agreement, and then we'll give to the group of the prototype um, a summary, a report, a final report with the identified problems, okay? And in this report, uh, uh, there is the indication of any violation of the heuristics that, that have been found during, during the evaluation. And the goal, obviously, is, is to help 
the designer to fix these kind of problems and design better, better interfaces. Any questions? So next time we will see in detail this technique and all the 10 uh, heuristics by Nielsen. And then we will also see an example uh, before the assignment, uh, the 15th of, of December, uh, so before assignment 5, uh, so that you can then conduct uh, uh, efficiently and successfully your uh, heuristic evaluation. So thank you for your attention and have a good day. <laughs>